They told me for years there was no money in podcasting. Well, they were all wrong. All right, all right, all right, everybody. What's up? Welcome back to another episode of Talking with Tara Shuck. My, uh, my redemption tour of speaking with everybody I used to work with or know in life continues with my guest, a former co-worker, a better friend, and an excellent producer, Adrian Jacobs. Adrian, my friend, how are you? It's so good to see you. Hi, Will. It's good to see you. It's been, it's been a minute. Almost a few years, I want to say, since I left Karma. It's been a long time. Probably the last time I saw you was your last day, which was in 2018. Uh, and yep. here we it are. It was May. <laughs> May. It was May 2018. Yeah, I left. Well, I got fired, I should say. I got let go in October the same year. Um, and then I pretty much started this company. So, and this was on unemployment, struggled, and just figured it out and made it work in two and a half years. Well, more than that. Four? Or it was a 2022 be four years almost yeah. here yeah. we are. So what's up? How have you, how have you been? Um, you know, good. Just trying to work consistently, you know, with COVID that kind of like fucked everybody up for yeah. a minute because yeah. nobody was shooting anything and they were like trying to figure out how to shoot stuff. So, you know, just really everybody's starting to get back into the swing of things of like opening offices and like actually being able to do productions so hopefully, like I just did a gig not too long ago, but it was for like a, a, a creative agency. Mm -hmm. And then before that, it was for MTV. But I feel like I'm going to move more into post-production as far, you know, as opposed to pre-production or production. It's just, to be honest, it's easier to find jobs. Like finding a producer job is crazy right now. Like it's almost near impossible because there's so many people out there trying to get them and there's not as many programs and people aren't shooting as much and it's just a whole bunch of nonsense so i was like i'd rather move into post-production because things are always getting edited and always getting mm -hmm. colored mm -hmm. and always needing audio mix down so i'm like if i can get into like a post-production house like i feel like that's more job security a little less creative but then i have my own website and brand so if i really want to do my creativity that's where i'll lend it to as opposed to like because looking for these creative jobs constantly it's a little stressful especially as a freelancer because it's like if you don't start a job a week after you leave one or at least a week or two after you leave one like the whole finance anxiety comes on because you're like yeah. well you need to pay but you know what i mean so it's i feel like moving into post-production is going to be a little bit more sound for me and a little bit more stable why I try to work on, you know, my own brand. I, th I think that was the biggest eye opener for me because, you know, I joined Karma fresh out of school, right? Fresh out of college, not knowing anything in the world to that. Right. My salary was the most money I ever thought of in my entire life. So I just took it and ran. But, you know, working with people like you, George Lois, Hex, and all those people who have been in production forever, I was just like, oh, this is a gig economy. I didn't even know what the gig economy was. Never heard that term in my life. I didn't understand freelancing. None of that. So I guess COVID made a small world already smaller. So it, is it starting to bounce back? Is it better than it was? And you stuck around in New York the whole time. And New York production scene itself was already small compared to right. like the LA or anywhere else in the world or Hollywood. But it's tough out there. It, it's a, right. So why, why continue doing the gig economy then freelance? You just like the freedom or is it just that much harder to get full-time work in this industry? Uh, it's harder to get, A, it's harder to get full-time work. And the actual full-time, like the things that are offered as full-time is not something that most of us do. Like, fortunately for me, I've worked in news. Most of the mm. full-time gigs are in things like news, mm -hmm. stuff like that, or creative agencies or post-production. Do you know what I mean? That's right. where most of like the full-time, like actual salary positions are. And news, if you're not like on air camera talent, or if you're not like one of the segment producers, if you're just like a news writer, like it's not, it's not the same thing as producing. So news is like, and eh, unless you've already done it, you don't really want to do it. And in addition to that, if you haven't been in news, it's going to be hard for you to actually get into it if you're coming from like just doing like commercials or something because yeah. it's, it's structured completely different. So um, I would prefer having a full-time job, but it's like, 
getting a full-time job at places like MTV or ESPN or BET or like Good Morning America. Like people don't leave those jobs ever. Like I used to work at Inside Edition in from 2004 to 2008. The majority of the producers that were there are still there. Mm. Like, so a lot of people who are my, you know, in my grouping of story producers or story coordinators ends up leaving the company because the producers that were there were not going. So there was nowhere, you know, there's no room for movement. Like there are producers that, um, good morning America and like Dateline and all these places that left inside edition in like 2005 and are still producers there. So like from, to me, I feel like news is hard to grow if there's somebody there who's really, really, really good at their job and they're not trying to get rid of. Yeah. So that's, you know, I, I prefer not to freelance. In fact, I hate freelancing. I hate a gig economy. I really, really, really hate it. I know it works well for some people who I I think also it's the type of jobs and the type of stuff that you produce or shoot that you're able to get like a rolling, you know, job after job after job. Cause there's some people I know who are never out of work. And then there's other people I know who are always out of work. My friend is a production manager and just got a job after two years. And luckily he's working on Jersey shore. I'm like, that's the type of show that like, that's good because if they continue going with another Jersey shore vacation, whatever next summer, you have another job and you're at a production company where they just hire production managers and you're given like a slate of shows to produce, like to manage. So, you know, things like that. Right. But see, I don't want to do that anymore, which is another reason why I started my own company. Cause I want, to build on that and I don't want to work for anyone and I don't want to like, I don't, I don't like to hustle for a check every day. Right. Like it's, it's a pain. And especially at my age, I don't want to do that. Like I want to retire soon. Well, not soon, but well, yes, yeah, soon, but I don't want to continue work. I don't want to work myself to I'm 70. You know what I mean? Yeah. But- you, you got, you got an end goal in mind. So let's, let's pivot to like, cause I hear that a lot. Cause a big reason why I started this, like, yeah, I don't want to work for someone not because like I want to work whenever I want. It's because the only security I have is relying on myself. You know right. what I mean? But the idea of I want to work my own hours, I find that's a myth. Because when you have right. your own brand, your own thing, you're always working. You're never yep. not working. I fall asleep thinking about Ambiguous Podcast Solutions. I fall asleep thinking about this podcast when I wish I could just fall asleep and going to a job the next day where it's just like, oh, I'm worried about the next day. Instead, I got both. <laughs> so do you, do you right. find that too? It's like when you're trying to do your own brand, it's not like, well, it's not that it's not what I thought it would be. It's just that the whole idea of I want to be my own boss is really kind of bullshit. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> like, I, I know how you feel with the whole going to like going to sleep late. Like I'm always blogging and like I, it's a lot of work because you have to update. Like I have a website. I have merchandise and I have mm-hmm. social media mm-hmm. and I'm doing a show. So like I have to keep my social media pages updated constantly. Ha- I have that to, algorithm, baby. <laughs> into right? I have to make sure that I have new merchandise. So, and that goes into like, I do drop shipping. So I actually have to go and design these things. Mm-hmm. And before I even add them to the store. So that's, you know, another layer I'm working on a show. So doing interviews with people, setting them up, doing graphics. Like I had to teach myself after effects and all these other things just so I can do like cool graphics and show opens. It's a lot of work. So no, you don't like, you don't get to work the hours you want because if you want it to be successful, you're literally working all the time. Cause when I'm not working on my site, I think about, Oh God, I should be working on it because the, le- the less time I spend on it, the less amount I, I feel like the less success I'm going to have. Like I need to constantly be working on it. I don't want to like lay there and not work on it because if it doesn't become successful, I'm the only one to blame because I'm the one who didn't take the time to actually work on it. Like I should have been. So I'm always working. Well, I, I, I definitely carry that mentality too. I remember at karma, like my mentality was, I want to learn as much as possible, right? Be that sponge. I believe you, Nakia, a lot of people told me that, that kind of thing. Like never turn down an opportunity to learn something. Um, right. I still take that. Like I, I have taught myself VMix, this program. I try to teach myself like Illustrator, After Effects. I'm still kind of getting there, but it's just like, you know, I could, tr- if I had the money, I would hire people to do these things for me. 
but I don't. So I got to learn them myself. You know, I got right. the job I'm at now, like my nine to five job contracted out. Um, I didn't really know how to do live production. I've never done live production. I've never used live stream studio six, but I had a killer interview <laughs> and, and, right. and they rolled the dice and took a chance and they taught me. It's just cause I had the open mind to continue learning. Like right now, I told you before you start recording, like I'm going to Miami for a conference in a few weeks where I'm literally learning everything from scratch. I'm just like, it's, it's daunting. It's a lot, but it's so exciting. Like I was like, I'm on set again. I'm setting up cameras again. I'm setting up lighting. I'm trying to fiddle out, figure out how to do our uh, manual focus instead of autofocus, right? Like figuring out the lights and how light bounces off people's face and different guests and the cameras and all that stuff. So it's like, you gotta be in a perpetual state of learning in the production right. world, because you never know what skill is going to be useful the next day. No, that's true. I mean, I'm still learning. Yeah. Like I'm like, I'm learning all the time. I'm constantly teaching myself. I have to literally, I've taught myself everything in the Adobe creative cloud, everything. Cause for some reason I'm always like, shit, I need to learn how to do such and such. And I'm like, Oh, I think there's something in Adobe that I can use. Like I'm designing sneaker bags right now. I have to like actually learn how to design a bag. Mm -hmm. Like not for not bullshit stuff. Like I actually have to look, learn how to design a piece of clothing because I want to be able to send this somewhere to get the bag made. So I need to know how to do measurements. I need to know how to do things in 3d, 2d. Like, so it's, it's, I'm constantly teaching myself and learning. So take me, take me through that process. How do you, how do you teach yourself? Now, obviously YouTube's a great place. Uh, Adobe has a lot of tutorials and guides for like learning out the tutorial processes, but Sometimes those aren't even the best. So how do you go about teaching yourself how to use these products? Well, I'll use some of those things like the videos or I'll Google the question and mm -hmm. read what the users will say. A lot of the times it's that and then I'll go into the program and play with it. Like I will literally go in there and be like, what does this button do? Okay, so let me go. It says it does this. Let me go Google what that means. Okay that button is for me to do such and such with After Effects. Mm. Like, so it's always playing around and reading, like cross-referencing a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Sometimes I don't really like watching those YouTube videos because I, I just, I can't, like that, my attention span, I'm like, I just can't sit there and watch the video. I actually would rather read it and then go watch a video. Mm. So like I said, it's a lot of cross-referencing on how to learn these things, asking other people who might know. Um, a friend of mine, he did uh, graphics for my show, but I needed to do graphics for like a project I was working on. So he's like, oh, if you go to this, this website in Vato, it's kind of like creative cloud. You can download show opens and then you can actually drop them in After Effects and step-by-step step, you can change them and create them and do all these things. I'm like, that sounds amazing. Went and got the program, dropped it in, found the like a uh, sample of what I wanted as far as a show open. And literally it's almost like step-by-step. Step, it takes you into each effect and shows you what each effect does, how to change it, how to add other stuff. So now I feel like, okay, that's great. I'm almost like an expert in After Effects. Well, for myself, not, I couldn't go do this for a job. They'd be waiting all day for a graphic, but um, like, it's, it's kind of like that. It's just a lot of cross-referencing and reading and watching and asking people, yeah. uh, taking notes. So even when I'm doing these things, I have to look at my notes and be like, all right, so what does this mean? Let me go see if I have this written down somewhere so I can understand it. I kind of like that though. Like, I like that I have to rely on myself. I like that I'm forced to put myself in a situation where I just got to figure it out. So right. like, what's your day-to-day -day job like? I'm like, dude, I just figure shit out. It's just like, here's a problem we have. Like the pandemic, for example, is a great example. I was in studio in a broadcast room for um, from August to March, 2019 into 2020 where everything was there for me. And then 2020 happened, the pandemic happened. How are we going to do this remotely? And we just like said, fuck it, we'll figure it out. Like they didn't cut my hours. I didn't lose any money. I actually worked way better from home. So what we did was we started out recording the audio on Zoom and just getting like some sort of visuals. Because at, at that point, it was two weeks to flatten the curve. 
Still, right. it's still two weeks to fly. It's the longest two weeks of my life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we take the audio and then overlay the, the images in live stream Studio 6 and then feed it out live afterwards. So it's like, okay, this works. This is feasible. And then we moved up to a podcaster where we would record the video and then input the video into Studio 6 and um, then edit that way, edit the graphics, the charts, the B-roll, et cetera, put it out live. And then we were like, okay, how can we do this on like actual video with a background template like you're seeing right now on your screen? And then I, then I was just like, well, I know there's this program called vMix. Let's look into it. Let's figure it out. So we ask our AV team, like, oh, we know how to use this. So they taught me how to use it. We upgrade. We're now on like stage four of this program. But, you know, this was pretty much just, we have this problem. You figure it out. And they kind of lied, lied on me to kind of take charge and just figure it out. I used the resources I had available. And it's just like, right. looking back over these past two years, there's nothing more satisfying than saying, I just figured it out, man. I just figured right. it out. I mean, I shot a pilot via Zoom for something that I was doing. So. What was that like? Because I love Zoom. I also hate Zoom, but I love Zoom. So what was like shooting the whole pilot on Zoom? Well, first of all, it was pretty ridiculous um, because they wanted it to not look like it was on Zoom. Mm. Don't know how we were going to get around that. And like my editor graphics guy is super amazing. My Bailey can do anything. Literally I call Bailey up and be like, can you do such and such? And he's like, if I don't know how to, I'll figure it out. Like, and Bailey always does, but he usually knows how to do these things. So, you know, I got him on the call with the, um, like the director of development who I was working with. They were telling them, you know, we were talking about the type of show because I was doing a comedy show and it was supposed to be kind of like girl code, guy code, or the history of the curse word. Mm. So, but we were talking about um, things in black culture. So it would be like, we had a team of comedians and we would ask like these questions and they'd give us their answers based on like their upbringing or where they came from. And it was really funny. Like the show would have been really cool if we could have done it in a studio. And we actually, at the time, we actually could have done it in studio. Like we could have went and shot each person separately, one-on-one -on -one somewhere. And, but you know, that's, that's all I want under the bridge. So what the way we did it is Bailey had to actually control it as if he was on camera, like he was a cameraman. Mm -hmm. So he had the Zoom, everything set up. He spoke with each guest, made sure like their rooms kind of looked similar, made them add things just because, like I said, they wanted to make it look like it wasn't on Zoom, but there's no way to do that. Do you, do you, you know what I mean? Like, cause it's in a grid. Yeah. So it's, he was, it's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible. So he did it the best way he did. There were a lot of like single shots or he, the way he was able to edit it, he could, if there was a, you know, how the four people would be in the grid, he mm -hmm. would be able to edit it where you would only see two people and their reactions. So it was good, but it was still, you know, it was soon. Um, and it was time consuming because you would have to shoot one person by themselves and then shoot the group because, and you'd have to get them to do reactions and everything, right. because if you're shooting it on zoom, if anyone makes a noise or how it just, it was very hard to try to get them to do reactions. So we would use a lot of the stuff that they shot, um, solo for like their cutaways and things like that. Cause it was just too hard to try to do all together. Um, ultimately, it still looked like it was Zoom, no matter with all the cool graphics, the background he added, the music, it still looked like Zoom. So I'm assuming, well, I don't think they picked it up. I haven't seen it anywhere, but <laughs> I haven't seen any of the other shows that they like commissioned for pilots that year either. I think it was just something that they were trying to do during COVID while um, they were launching this network. But it was... Like, don't ever try to shoot a pilot on Zoom. In fact, I feel like I'm I'm over Zoom. I'm really, really, really over it. I'm over it at this point. When you were like, go to the Zoom link, I'm like, oh, God, I was getting so used to people using Google Meets the past, like, two weeks. I got to go back to this? Well, Google, Google, Meets, Google Meets, fine. Like, I have no issue with Google Meet, but... <laughs> In order to get uh, yeah. the feeds of the call, it uses NDI. 
it to get yeah. it into the package. So if someone, yeah. if I, if the, so, this is recorded on Zoom. If someone's surprised that this is Zoom, you know, great, you, you we fooled you, we got you, mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> but there's it. another program. What's his name? Mike told me to use, but that wasn't so fantastic. That I actually used for that um, pilot. I forgot what it was, Mike Scalambro. Um, I gotta, but, I'm trying to get yeah, him on the podcast too, but he just moved, so I had to reschedule. Uh, yeah, I was about to say, didn't he just move to Jersey? He just moved to South Jersey, yeah, or Central Jersey. I am about to say South Jersey. I know his, his kids won't be going to school in New York ever again, but if he moves to South Jersey, he might as well go work in Philly. Yeah, he's in, he's a, in Central Jersey. Wait, you're from Jersey? Jersey. Uh, I'm wait, from, no, you're from Boston. I'm from Boston, but I live in Jersey. I live in Hoboken. Chris is from Jersey. Chris, Chris is from yeah, Central South Jersey, correct? Yeah. Adrian, you should have seen his bachelor party. So we was it was um well on the podcast we did which actually just released today by the way, shameless plug. Uh, we talk about it, but it was with like five of his. It was his, with his two brothers and like his three cousins, and then me and then a few of his other friends. But his Wait, his two brothers, his two brothers. <laughs> Remember, uh, uh, I think Dom came into the into the into the, uh, yes, into, into the office once. Brothers. It's like taller, like more attractive Chris, and <laughs> like Chris is a good-looking guy. But the rest of his family is like they're all the same. They're all like carbon copies of each other. So picture like four or five different flavors of Chris Scally, plus like four of the guys in Miami. It was like the Jersey Shore went to Miami. <laughs> Oh, fun times. Fun. <laughs> it was the best, man. It was it was so much fun. I had so much fun. I've been on a bachelor party. So my first one in Miami was amazing. Let's talk about let's talk about Chris a little bit because there were a few times. <laughs> there were a few times where so for, this is what everyone knows. It was four of us in the production office. It was Nakir at the front, then Adrian, then me, and then Chris. And let's just say I was glad sometimes I was sitting in between Adrian and Chris because Adrian was going to get up, go over there, and backhand this son of a bitch really <laughs> silly. Because he would say some really stupid things, and I'm like, come on now, Chris. Stop <laughs> it. You, like, you've gotten this far in life. Stop. Stop. You sound nuts right now. He would say really silly, ridiculous things, and I'm like, but why are you saying that? You, are you saying that because somebody else told you that? Like, or like, you're not, because he would say things, I'm like, you don't have any reason to say that. Like, please explain yourself for saying X, Y, and Z. Because I remember we had like a conversation about Democrats and Republicans and he said something very stupid. I'm going to say whatever it was he said was stupid and you can tell it wasn't something that he it was an independent thought. Right. It was like something that he had gotten on a, a, a Twitter feed or something that Alert had sent him and he literally said it verbatim mm -hmm. and I'm like you sound crazy right now and then Makia yelled at me and I'm like no you should be yelling at me yell at the idiot right here like but yes Chris used to say crazy things and just crazy stuff used to happen in that office because the, the rest of the office was pretty uptight except for Mike's room and then I guess that's why they moved Mike's room next to our room um but everyone else was like uptight and quiet and it, they were I don't know what were we working on finance and impact investing and yeah well, they, uh, they how do you market that like they were all also in the bullpen so they were all out there in the open well we could close our door have our private space and be ridiculous and hang up pictures of adam johnson I in the office in bullpens and horseshoes and still had the same conversations when i was at picks we we sat outside like mm. <laughs> out out in the middle of the office i mean they, no, they just, I mean, it's okay. They're born people. It's I don't finance. care who sees this either. <laughs> finance, bros, man. I mean, there's only, I there's only so, many things, there's so, many, so many times you can look at a spreadsheet before you want to lose your minds. And every now and then you hear Andy cackle. And that's really is how it is. Um. By the way, I still have no use for spreadsheets. Um, oh, I, I still I don't know do, why I still... David wasted his time trying to teach any. Well, I was like, I don't know why you're trying to teach me. I'm never going to use this. I can tell you this right now today. I'm never going to use a spreadsheet where I'm going to have to use a formula. I, and, I, I still I David eyes my spreadsheets 100%. I still do even it. Tell you how. It, it, it's ingrained I, I in my budgets. brain. I have budgets on spreadsheets that someone sent me. So they already have the little, 
Yeah, so someone, little... someone literally did David's job <laughs> and then sent it to you. So I'm like, oh, I don't need to do any of this. Oh, I put that number there. That's where that number is going. Oh, it's going to add that. Okay. That's all I need to know. And I will keep, I will keep those spreadsheets for the rest of my life because I'm never making one. Like ever. Well, what was it like? What was it like working with us? What was it like? Well, I know it was like working with Chris. What was it like working with me? How was I as a coworker? Um, you were a young, you were a young kid. So I was 22. First, most kids, when they get out of college, they're either one of two things. They're either super annoying and super hungry, or they're a little laid back. You were a little laid back. And I used to always tell Nakia, we got to tell Will to just do whatever somebody asks him, even if he doesn't like it, because people look at that. I'm mm -hmm. like, people are going to continually, because Chris was always saying yes to everything. He was like, yes, ma'am. Yes, 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 yes. Which is why people will always ask Chris, can you do this? Can you do that? Because he was always saying yes. I'm like, Will's going to miss an opportunity if he, because people are going to be like, oh, he won't do this, so don't give it to him. And then gradually, you just started working on everything. I think it might have been around the time they wanted, or right before we started doing those stupid um, themed months or whatever that nonsense was. I, I, and we I forgot all about that. There's so many things yeah, from that job I forgot. It is because they just didn't make sense. But right. thanks for bringing that back in my mind. I got to remember <laughs> themes. Like, this this theme is like, it's like I fintech or something. Because that's the only one I remember. Mm. Mm. Because Tamra was working so hard on it, and Day Zero in Africa about the water. That's the only thing I remember. But I do remember, like you, once we started getting into that, even though, like, and that was no, even before then. When they right before they decided they were going to cut the budgets and we weren't going to do anything ever again, that. You were doing a lot more with Hey Gordon because I think that's when like George yeah. was really yep. like in it in it. Yeah, as we, we, we did to, that. Like, we did that shoot in the office. It was like a war zone with like yes, smoke, I remember smoke, that. smoke, lights. Like we we kind of broke some things and then fixed them. Right. Yes, you did. That was so much fun. Now, I, I hope like, I can bring George on. We can talk about that because that was so much fun. Yeah, you should be. I'm gonna hit him up when I get off the phone. Yeah, tell, the tech, tell him to text up. me. Tell him to text me. I'm like, you better go do Will show. Or I'm not talking to you. <laughs> um, so yeah then you start but you're like i said that was your first job out of yeah. college like of course nobody can like fault you for being a little lackadaisical at first but you got your ass in gear quickly and you were doing work the commercial you were dope with that like you did a lot of work on the commercial so it was cool chris was all right chris was my smoking buddy me and chris used to gossip and giggle and do all that stuff mm -hmm. um, in the office. He was ridiculous. He, he would say ridiculous things. And me and, me like, and him why? together are ridiculous. I'm like, why do I know you? We're, we're <laughs> such a duo. Me and Chris are such a duo. I'm so, actually, I'm surprised you guys are still friends. Only because you seem a lot, di like you two seem a lot different from each other. Mm. Uh, I, I get that. I get that. Like I was like, I, I, it's not so much he wouldn't be friends with you. I don't see you having like a whole bunch of friends like Chris. No. I, well, no. You don't. <laughs> Although the, the closest one I can say is Jared, who is uh, my business partner. He's a CEO of Biggest Podcast Solutions. You would like Jared, Adrian. You and Jared would click very well. He's kind of, he he's from Montclair, uh, New Jersey. Family kind of comes- I know where Montclair is. <laughs> family kind of comes from money. Um, but- He's he's great. <laughs> you and him, you would even get along very, very well. I mean, it was fun working with you guys in the office. Like, it was jokes on jokes on jokes. I hated that everybody would just walk in there like they could. Like when Carly used to just walk in there, I'm like, Chris, I don't care who she is. First of all, you don't walk into anyone's office like that. Teach her some office etiquette. Like, mm. she knows better. I don't care who we like. And I'm like, Nikki Nik Nik used to get annoyed with that too. Like, just don't walk in there. You're not like. David or Neil or Karam, someone who should be walking into an office yeah. unannounced because they have something. To, she'd be like, oh my God, can I tell you something? I'm like, if you don't get out of here, and I like her. <laughs> and I like her. I used to go in her office and chit chat with her. When, oh, you know what picture I found the other day? And oh. I should send it to you. Send it to me. What's her name when she went to sleep in the office? 
Oh, was that? Remember, she went to Carly's office to take a nap. Is that Anna? And I took a picture of it, and everybody got mad because I took the picture. Like, why would they I'm like, go suck a dick. I took a picture because the bitch is fucking sleeping during working hours. What are you talking about? Why did I take a picture? I mean, I really, I really don't have many negative things to say about that job. That time I spent that job, I am thankful for every minute. I would do it all again, but I, I'll never forget how many times Mike would tell me, "This is not a conventional office. Like this is not, this is not like traditional work experience. Like it's experience, but it's not like, and like, and not that it's not real experience because it was a. It, don't get me wrong, it's a real job. It's still on my resume, and I loved every second of it. But the idea of like, remember, we didn't get paid. Like two payroll cycles. Please don't don't talk <laughs> two. It was like three, and one of them was my birthday weekend, and I was supposed to be getting on a flight to LA that day, like after work, and we didn't get paid. Yeah, like there there were there were these things where it was just you know bad leadership, and just like we kind of skirted the rules, but we it was a tech startup. You you had to do what you had to do, and. I, I don't I don't hold grudges against anyone we used to work with. I don't know about you. I can't speak for you. Uh, I mean, I don't hold grudges because I don't really give a fuck about nobody like that to hold yeah. a grudge. Like nobody did anything to me. Like I I don't like people regardless. So <laughs> if I didn't like you while I was at Karma, I probably still don't fucking like you. Like mm. it had nothing to do with me not being there. Like I bounced. I got the fuck out. I left. I got hired and was like, I'm leaving in two days. See you all later. Like, I, so I'm, I'm not, I don't have any animosity against anyone there. I think a bunch of people there are fucking assholes and they probably still are assholes, but there were a good group of people that I did like, like all you guys in my office, everyone in Mike's office, Lucy, Tamara, mm. the tall kid that came for like two weeks. He was like a marketing kid. I think his name was, I forgot his name. Oh, G- Gervais? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, G. The fucking, um, the lawyer chick. And oh, Stephanie? Andy, yep. Yeah, Stephanie. And Andy was okay most of the time, but other than that, who else was left? Oh, Carly. She was, Carly was a normal person. The people in the, the creative room were fairly normal too because they kind of just stayed in their room and minded their business. Yeah, they were like, they just constantly to, creating graphics and stuff. For, like, yeah, they, they weren't trying to like, do anything crazy like so they were cool that whole section in the middle nope they can all kiss my ass and i think they all knew that's how i felt about them yeah and I, I don't, you you uh you, and, you, and i honestly don't care how they felt about me and i don't have any animosity about like i don't feel bad about feeling that way yeah. a lot of them were condescending you're trying to tell people how to do production work you've never done production you all are walking around like being lazy not doing anything but like it was just a bunch of bs so yeah and yeah. there were a bunch of little slime balls out there like there was one person out there who was a snake 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 but you know i know i know exactly who you mean um <laughs> i i tried i tried not to have that that chip on my shoulder i tried i tried to be humble where it was like i don't i don't know what i'm doing that's why i'm asking you guys for help and i learned i learned a lot from lucy i learned a lot from tamra i learned a lot from you nikki i even learned a lot from chris um oh those guys too you know who i forgot what's your name the crazy girl who i had to yell at because i'm like if you don't stop following me i'm gonna cost you <laughs> who's that crazy bitch the crazy eyes and she was short blonde hair she almost got knocked out and lucy's um no, no the hey gordon chick oh oh um Ah, uh, Vanessa. Yeah. She was one day at Lucy's thing. I was like working at the, the store and I'm trying to do something at the pop-up shop. And she's like standing behind me with the stupid little smirk and following me around. I'm like, keep following me around and see what the fuck happens. Like, I'm not playing with you. I got, I will make you hit me and, and I'll hit you back and call it self-defense. Like, stop playing with me, Vanessa. I'm like, Nikki, you better tell her to get somebody get this girl away from me. And then since she got beef with Cynthia, oh, I knew she was going to be gone. I was, like, I was like, oh, you're about to be out. You fucking with Cynthia? I'm not even, I'm just going to stand over here. You about to be gone. And I think she was gone not long after, right? I don't know if she left, but. I I think that that whole, I feel, I really feel bad for that whole Hey Gordon crew. Cause they. That was fucked up. Cause that show was actually really funny. It was so much fun. That's the money. That's the show they probably should have put money into 
because that show probably would have gotten sold. It was because so there's much no, fun. There's still no show like that right now. Yeah, they were great. Um, I'll never, I'll never forget. I, I was okay. I'll tell the story. Exact. So I, I, I really want to have Karam on this podcast too, but I know he's not going to do it. Karam, if you're out there, I know you like my content. Please email me back. I'd love to. Um, Karam still emails me every now and then, believe it or not. Um, oh, well, that's nice. Yeah, <laughs> Karam, Karam just loves me. I don't know what it is. Okay, I actually didn't have a problem with Karam. He was just quiet. Like I never really had a problem with him. He was quiet. I didn't really have to talk to him too much unless it was something that Nakia had me doing. But other than that. He didn't really bother me too much. I remember we were doing a set. We were doing a shot for Hey Gordon. It was the one in the bat. It was one in the in the pool, um, like in the uh, the, the, the above ground pool, or whatever. And we went. We filmed it at Karam's friend house, friend's house, and he was on there at, on some. There's like a long day. We didn't finish until like ten a.m. ten p.m. Um, and Karam just goes, "We're just cracking jokes." And Karam just goes, "Oh, well, I'm so glad I hired you." I just go, "Ah, oh, Karam, me too." <laughs> and that was just, that was that was the kind of relationship me and Karam had because he like he was a CEO of the company, but he felt like one of the boys. You know what I mean? Like he was ten. Yeah, he was. Karam- I mean, all of you were ten, so of course he felt like everyone there was literally. We're gonna go five to. More years younger than me and Nakia. Yeah, Karam was my age now when he was running this company. He was 27 years old. Uh, wild. Absolutely wild. But it is what it is. Life life goes on from karma, and it comes way to back to bite you. I'm just glad that all my jobs in production have been uh, either full-time or contract. Um with benefits. It's so like, I got 401k oh, and health, health insurance right now. So I've never like not had health insurance, which, you know, my medical history, were you, right. were you there, uh, for next, when, when did you start at karma? Do you remember? September, September. Oh, no, I started the bear. You all had that stupid conference and I started on that Monday. Okay, Whatever so, stupid conference you had in the fall, I started that following Monday, so, September. So you started right around Chris then. All right, yes. so, so you you started at there was Concordia, okay. Yes. So, so you weren't you weren't there the first conference, like the Nexus conference or something. I actually still have my press. I actually have my press credentials, but uh, day one after the conference, I ended up in the hospital for like four days. I got a Crohn's flare up. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, you, so, you, so you weren't there for that. You weren't there for that. Well, Woo. thank God. Yeah, that was this rough. I remember. I remember Tamra, like, called me. And it was like, we need, um, what's like the, the tape that's like skin colored? What's that called? Oh, I forgot. Dubi- no, it's not Dubutine. Um, it's yeah, a, uh, yeah. It's like a band-aid. It's like gaff tape, but it's skin colored. Yeah, yeah. She called me and asked me to go to CVS to get one of those. And I was so sick and like so out of it. I bought notebooks. <laughs> For some reason, I bought just like notebooks, like, 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 a, like, a, like a one subject notebook. I go back to set. And I go, here you go. She's like, what's this? I'm like, no, I need this. And she gives me an example. I was like, oh. So, so I went back. <laughs> and then like on the, on the way back to set, I like threw up in a trash can. Um, I called the kids. Like, I'm going to the hospital. Like go to CVS and buy this shit. Like, so we went to UN. I ended up going to NYU Langone. It was like around the corner. I ended up going to the hospital. And uh, it was bad. <laughs> it was pretty bad. It could have been a lot worse. But I'll never, oh, for- I'll never, I'll never forget that. My first actual like work conference, I was there for a day because they put me up at the UN hotel for like the weekend, like three days. And I couldn't stay there. And I was so mad because the bed was so comfy and the toilet had a bidet. And I used a bidet. I see, before. I never got any of these cool perks working at Karma. I just got a bunch of nonsense and Neil talking about, well, she doesn't know this and such and such. That was really that was the the, the straw that broke my back, the camel's back. Um something about some script that Neil had wanted me to write. And then he was like, well, this doesn't make any sense. I'm like, this is the fucking shit you said. So if it don't make sense, it's you that's not making sense. Like I literally just wrote this script. Like I pulled your bites. I didn't like write anything. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I don't know what, what that's like to have a room for myself at the UN Hilton or wherever it was. I didn't get, I, me neither. You know, like, I, only, first workers, so. I, I only stayed there one night. <laughs> I only Crazy. stayed there one night and then I didn't even sleep that night. I couldn't sleep because I couldn't go to the bathroom. My intestines were blocked. So like I had this searing stomach pain and I had no idea. I thought it was just like something I ate or like a stomach ache or whatever, but no, 
I couldn't pass food. So that was a problem. Um, I'm good now, yeah, that was rough. Um, so what did, what did you do after karma? Um, cause you, um, you, had, I had, you had about a year before the pandemic. So what did you do in between then? Just job to job, bounce around? Um, well, I left karma to go work on the Meek Mill documentary. That's right. Uh, so I worked on that till what year was that? 2018? 18. I worked on that until December or January of 2019. Then the beginning of 2019, I didn't do anything. I was going to go crazy. Then I started working. Then that like April or May, I started working at I1 Digital, um, who owns like a bunch of different, um, they own TV One. And they own a bunch of different um, websites. So I started working there doing content mm. for one of their shows. Uh, then right after that, I was working at Complex. Um, and I did a pilot for Complex. And right after that ended, like, it was like a month where I didn't work. And I was getting ready to, like, find a job. And COVID hit. And then I didn't do anything till that summer. And then that summer I was working at the Source magazine. And then that fall I did um I did the uh pilot and then I didn't do anything again till like the following the next summer. So like the that that May, well that March through May, June, those months were like tough because I couldn't find work, especially during COVID, but then like for some reason I couldn't find work, but then I would find work. Yeah. Like I worked when I was at the source, I was there. I could have stayed there for much longer than I was, but that guy was a jerk, so I had to go. <laughs> Nikia knows because she did a shoot for him, so she knows he's a jerk. Um, but yeah, I I tried to work as much as possible. And then last year, that's when I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm so tired of production work in a sense where I'm ch- like not tired of production work i love production work i yeah. like all of it i'm just tired of chasing these field producing or producing jobs i'm like i'm gonna start my own business so that i can do my own content um sell some merchandise i want to do like encapsulate like a brand a whole brand for you know female sneaker enthusiasts where they can find news they can find clothing they can buy, you know, just anything, just one place to go to. So that's what I'm working on. Well, one of, I remember, I remember one of the things, um, cause it, there's a reason I, uh, I put, I start this podcast intro where they told me for years, there was no money in podcasting. Uh, I believe you were one of those people. Cause I remember like, I, I, I told you I did podcasts. No, and- I didn't say there was no money. I said podcasts are boring. I don't listen to that shit. I still don't listen to podcasts. <laughs> right, don't have but to you know podcasts. what? But you know what, people, but my point was made, I like, actually, my point was kind of made because what do podcasts do now? What is, like, one of the, what is, honestly, like, if you're doing a podcast, what is always in addition to it? What do people, have people been adding to it for years now? Your people are watching them. Why? Because nobody wants to sit there and fucking listen. Like, that's what, that was my point. People are now filming all, everyone's filming them. Mm-hmm. Fucking Drink Champs is a huge fucking show drink champs is huge for revolt i don't know if it'd be as big if we were just sitting there listening to nori i don't know that was my point and i, I don't know if they don't because there are there are people who listen to that mess but i'm like they're boring i don't but now you see what everybody's like well not now because it's been about five years since it's going on but slowly but surely you see people started like really filming them and really like going all out in the production, not only in just the audio, but the look at the Kia show. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, like, so it was, so it, everything built for that. So like, it, it was video for you that made podcasts legit then. Yeah. Cause I was like, mm. I, I'm something they don't, wouldn't make money because when we were, when, the pod, when we were working there, people were listening to podcasts. Right. I, I was, just, I was, I would listen to podcasts while I work. I still listen to pod. Well, not, well, I work because I need to focus on the content I'm creating. But like while I'm playing video games, while I'm cooking, right. while I'm in the shower, while I'm dry, whatever. It's like it's I I I don't know if I I don't like if I coined this back then, but I can I coined it now. Podcasts are the number one form of secondary entertainment. 
Whereas you're, you're right. No one sits down in their room like crisscross applesauce and listens to a podcast. Maybe just one or two. But the vast majority don't. They do it while they're doing something else. Well, that's what uh, David said. He was like, oh, this is something I would listen to while I'm in the kitchen cooking. Exactly. But I think he was talking about something specific. Um, he was talking about something specific when we were doing, were, you know, going through the whole podcast conversation. And he was saying, you know, that's something that I would listen to, like, while I'm in the kitchen cooking. So, mm. yeah, I get it. Like, I mean... To, honestly, I do that with TV. Like, sometimes I'm not actually watching the television. Yeah, it's just noise. I'm listening to it. It's noise. But I can look up and I see something. <laughs> like, so, but yeah, the video to me has, has helped it. Like, it's now it's more of a, you know, watching a talk show as opposed to watching or listening to talk radio. Yeah, it's, I a, it's evolved. I think I think the main difference for me when it comes to podcasts as opposed to any other form of media that's produced, like how we would produce it, is that you as a consumer, as a listener, have so many options. You can listen right. to it on Apple with all the other podcasts. You can listen to it on Spotify. You can listen to it on Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Amazon, Flubber, whatever. Make something up. You can listen to it wherever you want or yeah. you can watch it. You can cons you can consume the full hour podcast like this one's going to be, or you can do it in four or five different clips, which I'm going to cut next week. Like you, you as a consumer can consume it however you want and get the same gratification as anyone else. And you just don't get that in TV. You don't get that in film. You don't even get that on Netflix. The big thing about podcasting is that there's no such thing as exclusivity. I was talking to someone just uh, right before I got on the phone with you. She was, she was like, want to use your distribution. She's like, I only want it on Apple and Spotify. And I go, that's dumb. Why? I was like, for example, I have Android. I listen to all of my podcasts on Stitcher, unless you're Joe Rogan. If, you, if, you do, if your podcast isn't on Stitcher, I'm not going to listen to it because that's how I consume my content. So you got to tailor your shit to everybody. So like, is, is that kind of sentiment true for any other type of, content out there that you can think of or you've worked on or is that just a complete i just blew your mind well no it is um i feel like it can be you it lends itself to all kinds you know what i mean all types yeah. of, in the medium um but more specifically to podcasts for sure for sure for sure um to me um i feel like every Every, you can like you said you can find content pretty much anywhere and why wouldn't you want your content to you know be everywhere because people are going to listen to it or watch it or different ways you're absolutely right mm -hmm. for a person like me um if i may go i'm probably going to go to apple you know what i mean or spotify Somebody younger than me is probably going to not do that. They're probably gonna, like, so you should be able to have it like everywhere. And I also feel like if you're going to do content, you should nowadays, con you, you kind of want to make it where everybody can kind of enjoy it too. Right. Like I, I do sneaker content, but I don't, and it's, you know, sneaker content for women, but that's really just the only pigeonholes. I don't care what kind of women or who's watching, like, it's just those two things. I don't care where I post this information. It's on Facebook. It's, it's everywhere because there's sneaker enthusiasts that are women of all ages. They're not just like 22 or on TikTok. So I feel, A, you should have all your stuff everywhere, and B, in your content, you should try to make it at least enjoyable for everyone. Even if it's someone who might be older, at least try to add something, you know, that would make, you know, they would probably enjoy it. Like, you don't have to, an aspect or talk about something or, so for my thing, um, a lot of people, a lot of females my age aren't huge enthusiasts, but there are some, and the ones who are like are like me will spend money on sneakers. We're not going to wait online and all those things. But one of the content, one of the things that I do almost every Thursday or as many Thursdays as I can is I do a throwback Thursday. 
Mm-hmm. And it's usually about some old school pair of sneakers or someone who wore a pair of old school sneakers in a video. And it's not anyone from today. Like, so I've done old, uh, throwback Thursdays on people like MC Light, um, Queen Latifah, TLC, mm-hmm. because of specific sneakers that they're wearing that, you know, are now popular. Now for that, like all the people who are my age are like, oh, I remember when TLC wore those sneakers in that video. New kids are like, oh, these sneakers were out that long? Like, so I try to make sure that if I'm doing something that everyone, um, you know, can identify with something. And I think that's how they, that, I think that's how content should be done nowadays across the board, period. Yeah. I mean, look at even like TV shows. Look at Euphoria. That's a show that people think it's for a teen, like for teens, but it's really it's not. not. It's not. It, the show is incredible, too. First of all, teenagers should not be watching that no, show at, at all. all. Like, like uh, <laughs> we, we talked, so that uh, my friend Kay Murphy and I talked in, in depth about Euphoria. Um, you know that's my show, right? Remember my show that I wrote and I was pitching in L.A.? That's literally what my show was. Really? So someone, I'm not even joking. Who stole your idea? I can send you the trailer. <laughs> Every day we look at like the writers and try to find out. Like I could, say, they say it's based on the Israeli show by the same name, which is possibly true. I don't doubt that. But like, whenever I watch these episodes, there's just two. Like we really are trying to figure out who saw our deck and our reel that people like. Because Zendaya was our was our main character in our deck and our reel for a long time. Mm. Like that's her, and we actually reached out to her parents about it. They're the same character. Like it's just bugged out. Like it's literally the same show. That's the kind of show that I was going to do a show about teenagers that teenagers should not be watching. Yeah, no, teenagers should not watch that show. I was like maybe one or two episodes in like a senior year health class, right? Like for like that that exit that episode where Rue is just going through withdrawal. Like that's an episode you can show certain aged kids, like senior year high school. That particular the episode. Dad on the floor, you cannot. <laughs> no, no. Most of them you can't. Most of them you can't. That's the best scene in the whole series. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best scene in the whole series. If Eric Dane does not get nominated. For peeing on his foyer floor, I that's it. I won't be watching that show anymore. It's a great, it's a, uh, honestly, it's a great scene. I'm not gonna lie, I hated that. I hated that character, and then that happened. I was like, you oh, know, so this, guy's right. oh, this guy's so all right. This guy's all right. I hated him the entire show until he came and peed in his foyer. That's that's yep. what I'm like. This guy is kind of dope. This guy's got it on, dude. <laughs> this guy don't give a fuck. <laughs> He's like, Marsha, come back. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to go watch that scene a little bit because that shit kills me. Like, it literally makes me laugh hysterically. Mm. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, so you've had a you've had a long career, a very successful career. I know you've worked with a lot of celebrities um, or f- famous people. Uh, I remember you telling me once. I forget the celebrity. So I'm gonna spare the spare the possible of sharing the story. Um, but I have you telling me. Am I gonna get sued? No, no, no. <laughs> I have you telling me there's there's a lot of autographs out there who weren't signed by that actual oh! person. They were signed by me. <laughs> I won't yeah! we, we won't we won't say who, because I don't remember. <laughs> I, I could guess, but I don't want no, to myself or you under the bus. That I've ever done. I thought I that was I thought that was the funniest thing ever, ever. So unfortunately, I'm not. I'm not going to say what artist it is. And I'm not giving any hints. Nobody. Don't even say if it's an artist, actor. It could be a, a a musician. It could be anybody. It's a person. It's, it's a, a person. person that I worked for in my career at some point. <laughs> that I do know people wanted autographs. And sometimes this person was not available. <laughs> so there were certain people in the office who were taught how to do their signature. I was one of them. <laughs> I, you know, it's not something I'm proud of. I'm not proud of being no, able to Oh, yeah. No, be proud. I'd own that. I wouldn't say, I would never say who. Never say who, but, but own that. Do you, do you have any crazy stories you can share? From there? Oh, God. From anywhere. From anywhere. I'm going to say from there, I wish, I mean, there are some crazy stories, but the moment I even like begin to tell them, it, 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 people are going to figure out 
what I'm talking. Yeah, so just I don't get me you sued. Don't get us in trouble. Like, I'm not going to talk about anything prior to 2004. <laughs> Let me see. Do I have any funny inside edition stories? Or, like, or some stories with someone that's well known to the public that you've worked with or bumped into um, in any situation. <gasps> Shit. Now I have to think about this because, okay. Hmm, 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 hmm. There's a lot of hip hop artists. Yes, tons of hip hop artists. Because my first job out of college was at a record label, and I interned at a record label when I was um, when I was working. I mean, when I was in college, like I did a college intern program from my campus. So yeah, I worked with every like I worked with the top rappers, like the people who are top right now. I've worked with like I worked at the label. I worked them before they were the top rappers before they won platinum. Like most of my friends still work in the industry. And I'm trying to think of a really good story because I know I have one somewhere, but I might have smoked it away. Like I probably am not gonna remember for like three days. And I'm like, damn, I wish I could have told that story to Will. Okay, that story is inappropriate. Can't tell. <laughs> I'm thinking. Um, or, or, or any artists where you worked with them, they were small time, have since made it big time. Oh, well, I mean, that's silly. Kanye West. Like, come on. What, year, what, year, did you, what year did you work with Kanye? In 1998. Okay, you can't get much earlier than that. Really? Well, okay, well, 98 to 99. And he was, he was a producer for Rockefeller. He was he a producer was, who wanted to become a rapper. Everyone kind of laughed him out of the building. Right. And see, the one thing I will say about that, it's true, but it's not true. Nobody laughed him out the building, but people were not as... Supporting. Yeah, they, like, they didn't people, take it seriously. Right, but nobody was like, oh, get the fuck out of here. You can't do it. Right, right, people right, right. Like, all right, man, let me let me hear it. Let me hear it. So um, definitely, and I remember when he was over at, like, working with Derek Angeletti, which is another, the mad rapper who used to do all these things for Diddy. I remember when he was over there. And then um, I remember my two, uh, the two A&Rs that I worked with closely, Hip Hop and G were always getting beats from him for all the, the artists on the Rock Nation, uh, Rockefeller roster. Um, and then him and Just Blades, like they literally did Jay's Black album with either Kanye or Just Blades, who produced on that album. There was like nobody else. And that was what, maybe Jay's fourth album? Fourth or fifth? I can't remember. You know, you know I hate Jay-Z, so. Um, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I have no real feelings about him. <laughs> can't, stand, going on, can't stand him, man. <laughs> can't stand him. I will say him this by soapbox and fuck Jay-Z. I will say fuck Jay-Z to the heavens. Great musician, <laughs> phenomenal rapper, great writer, great producer. Just hate the man. I hate him. It's not even a, not, has nothing to do with music either. I hate him because of the right. Yankees. <laughs> he's not like, you know, he's in the, I will not. It was nice working for him. That was the best job that a 22-year-old could have had out of college, made absolutely no kind of money, but went on a whole bunch of trips for free, um, ate a lot of Mr. Chow's, mm. uh, got a lot of free clothes. So like when you're a 22 year old, you're just getting out of college. Your first job is working with the rappers in a building that's filled with nothing but record labels and rappers. And you all, only thing you guys do is go on vacation with each other, eat dinner with each other. Like, yeah. That was that was a great first job. That I will ne- like. I will never turn that time in for anything else. Never traded in. Had an aunt made friends that I'm still friends with to this day. Like I'm still friends with the majority of people who started with me at Rockefeller. Only people I can't get on the phone are Jay Z and Damon. I can get Biggs on the phone, maybe Jay. I I wouldn't even know how to. I mean, I would know. I know who I could possibly call, but it would never happen. I would never get him on a phone call. Right? Yeah, he's his schedule is ridiculous. But <laughs> like, I'd have to. Even when I worked on the Meek Mill documentary, and that, I'm actually kind of pissed off about this. Um, he finally decided he would do the interview with us because mm. he wasn't going to do it, and I think he decided because another one, I had gotten two former like rock. Uh, Rockefeller executives to do it and one of them I think is like is a really good friend of his so I feel like you know after asking and asking and since you know Meek was on his you know one of his artists I think he was like yeah you know what I need to do this 
everyone was super geeked. And I was working with like some fucking cornball crew. Like they didn't know anything about Meek Mill, but they knew like a whole lot about, well, the people who produced it did, but they knew a whole lot about Jay-Z. So like our director who edited like Fade to Black was so geeked out about doing this Jay-Z interview. And I was actually the field producer who was doing the majority of the in-person interviews mm -hmm. other than like this one other person, Isaac. And when it came time to do Jay-Z's interview, I was literally in LA that week. They flew me home the day before just so that the other guy who none of the other team wasn't even out there. The, well, the team wasn't even out there. So the, uh, director could come out and interview him because he really just wanted to interview Jay-Z. He didn't interview anyone else, but he wanted to do that interview. And I don't even think, I don't think he would have gotten, I probably would have gotten better answers from him because I actually have rapport with him. But I was actually pissed. I'm like, you guys just want to interview him because it's Jay-Z, not because you want to get a good interview. And that's kind of fucked up. Right. You want the name instead of the content. Right. It's that's like okay because I interviewed Rick Ross at 1.30 in the morning, like two, like two weeks later for that same, but they never, they never even used that footage. And that was a good interview. Rick Ross spilled some stuff. Oh. I'm so glad I still got that interview. Remember Neil? I kept that. Remember Neil huh? interviewed Styles P? Yes, I was there. I set it up. Yeah, that, <laughs> that I still, I, I, I still have that picture of the I well, we bus them, oh. on my wall. I look at it every day. <laughs> I mean, I think it pops up somewhere because I see it often too. Like I see this, I see that picture all the time. Yeah. That was a um, weird day. That was a weird thing. It's Neil of all people interviewing Styles P. But the funny thing is when we left him outside in front of Juice for Life in my old neighborhood, dressed like that, I'm like, we just going to leave him right there? I'm like, <laughs> someone's going to get him. He, he looked like I would get him if I walked by and saw that I would want to get him. Um, I mean, yeah, that was, that was another week, like stuff like that. We did all this good stuff and never got to like use any of it. Yeah. It's a shame. Like I, I, I sum up my time at Karma as amazing, worth every second, <laughs> but a lot of, a lot of wasted potential. Um, yeah, I feel like it was all right. Like I liked the, the people, some, like I said, I made some good friends, um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to really, I hate saying this and it sounds terrible. It didn't really do anything to advance my career. Mm. I didn't really, I mean, I met people who could help me advance my career. You know, people like Nakia and Mike and Tamara and Lucy. But as far as what I was doing, it's not even on my, my resume at this point anymore. Right. Yeah, it doesn't need to be. It doesn't really need to be because I we really didn't, I just feel bad saying we didn't accomplish much. Like when I was there, nothing that except for Tamara's one um, episode of that show. Not one number. Um, uh, inflection, inflection point. Inflection point. Yeah. Inflection point. Like I feel like we, nothing ever, like we didn't complete anything. Right. So, you know what? Somebody should call Karam right now and be like, yo, what did you do with all that footage? Let's get the band back together and put this stuff out. Like, put the stuff out. Just put it out. Make a quick buck. I I had a bunch of it, but uh, I had to clean up storage, so I got rid of most of it. The only thing I kept was the weekly Will Downs. <laughs> oh, my God. You had to do all those things. I totally forgot. Do you want them? I still have them if you want a copy of them. No, I do not. Can <laughs> you Nakia, don't want them? Nakia might want them, though. Uh, and when I next time I talk to Nakia, I'll have them. It was funny because... Um, I was doing a podcast like a year and a half ago called You Mad Bro, which then turned to American Minutes. Yes. And out of nowhere, like middle of 2020, Karam emails me out of the blue. He goes, Will, I want to congratulate you on your podcast and your, all your success and like, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I was just like, you know, thank you. Uh, I'm glad you like it. By the way, uh, here's all of the week, week, uh, weekly Will Downs. I gave him a copy of all of the all of the video files in case he wanted them because he loved them. He loved them so much. We, Come on, I swear to God, I want him on this podcast so bad. I'm going to keep doing the pray hands until I get him on because I think me and him would have a lot to talk about because that's the hard-hitting questions, Adrian. You have no idea. 
<laughs> what, like what? Oh, are you getting what hard at eating questions are you going to ask him? Dude, I just asked, like, what, like, what the fuck actually happens? Like, okay, that is a good question. Like, literally, what the fuck happened? Because, at, and honestly, I, I know the answer, like, unofficially. Um, I'll send you the article, because Chris sent it to me one day, about what probably actually happened, like, why. Oh! You have to send it to me as soon as you get off the yeah. phone. I didn't know there was an article. Like, like why, why all the, why all the funding got cut essentially? But I want to hear from the horse's mouth. Like, we were like, 2017 was such an amazing year, and then once January 2018, with the, when the budgets came up, it was just gone. <laughs> we went on Christmas vacation. We didn't even go on Christmas vacation because remember, like, maybe me and you, a few of us were going in and out of the office. Mike, Anthony, during the Christmas breaky type the thing yeah i know i was going into the office sometimes because they were working on budgets or something and then all of a sudden like oh tamra wanted me to make sure i had all this information for the her budgets for where she wanted to shoot because she wanted to do my friend's nba um thing she wanted to go do these beekeepers in california like we were rocking and rolling and then soon as like we got back she's like None of this is going on. I'm like, this, we just left two days ago. Like, yeah. What are you talking what about? Yeah, we, I, might, I, might, I might have some answers, but I want to hear it from the horse's mouth. But Adrian, we talked for about an hour. Uh, the last question always goes to the guest. So is there anything you've ever wanted to ask me on a public podcast forum? Now is your chance. You can always plead the fifth because I, I like to surprise people. No, I am going to ask you. Are you still with that girl? And is she black? Oh, my girlfriend? Uh, so my girlfriend is Jazz. We've been together. It'll be two years in July. Um, and she's Guyanese. I knew she was something. I'm like, look at Will. He's so cool. Yeah, I, I knew, I knew, you, I knew you'd be proud. Does that surprise you? I, I, ended up, girl. I, I ended up with a woman better. of color. Does that surprise you? <laughs> no, it wasn't surprising at all. It was far from surprising. Not from you, Will, No. After like, was it you that like Stephanie or was it Chris that liked Stephanie? I mean, we no, both liked, liked Stephanie, but Chris really liked Stephanie. You liked the girl from Whatchamacallit that came in. Corey from Culture Banks. Remember Corey from Culture Banks? She was one of the people we were had come in and do like once a week when we had that stupid room that was all white and we had to go film stuff and we were trying oh, the out new room. people. Yeah. Uh, yes, and we were trying out new people. She had like a pink dress one day and Will like lost his mind. I don't I don't remember. I, and I'm not just saying that because Jazz listens to this. No, I don't. I do, <laughs> I do not remember. <laughs> but you know, she's she's the best. She's a personal finance writer. Um, she keeps me on oh, my toes. Oh, is she really? Where does she work? Uh, she works, uh, uh, she works at NBC. I'll say it. CNBC. Oh, I would say my friend, no, I was about to say, if she ever needs a job, my friend Asia used to be the um, deputy manager of Debt Wire Merger Market, um, which is Financial Times, because Anthony, she had gotten Anthony a job over there, yeah. like last year, but now she works at Axio, so it doesn't make a difference. But I was going to say, hey, I don't know anyone else who writes about finance. Yeah, so no, when I hear that. She's, she's great. She's first generation American, so... Like her, her parents immigrated here. So she had to like learn so much about personal finance and I lost her again. Uh, all on her own. Oh, there you are. There you are. There so am, yeah, yes. so like she had to like learn about personal finance pretty much all on her own and she just beats that into me. So we're, we're, we're an adorable couple. We're a very cute match. And I should, I should send you what she got me for Christmas. It's just, oh. this, this picture just encapsulates. Actually, I'll send it to you right now. This picture, I want to get you live reaction to this. This picture She's encapsulates so cute, us. I was like, Will's girlfriend is so cute. Look at her. Yeah, I'm waiting for this. Yeah, I'm going to send this to you. Hang on. You can see me taking the picture of it right here on the phone. So it's just a giant, it's, it's my favorite picture of us. Now, let me send that out. And it's just it's just sitting on my desk under my TV. Uh, so whenever I watch TV, it's just it's just right there. Wait, come on! I want to see this. I just, te I just <laughs> no. texted to you. I'll I'll probably I'll oh, try there and, we go. I'll try and do an overlay. I got no no, no I got it. Oh, <laughs> is this, that a Hold great picture? On. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, she is so pretty, Will. She is. She's Look great. 
She is so pretty. I like her hair in that picture too. Look at well. He's like, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a long single ride working at Karma. Remember me and Chris did the? I don't know. It wasn't always oh, was a pop up shop. It was something for Lucy or Tamra. Um, where it's like all like the stalls like had different stores you could buy stuff like Mike's family had like the uh the, his muffins there his pastries yeah there was a pop up shop that was pop up shop remember after the pop up shop me and Chris went to go speed dating did you wait where did you guys didn't you guys go like somewhere close by it the was neighborhood? like it was like it happened to be in that neighborhood we signed up for speed dating and Chris was like with Carly at that point like talking to Carly consistently so is this really for me. And it was an absolute nightmare. I will never go speed dating ever again for as long as I live. It was awful. It sounds like it'd be a nightmare. It's awful. I was like, I'm 23 years old. Why am I speed dating? It's a terrible idea. Right. Like, go out. Yes, go out and be a person. <laughs> but, yeah. I say that to people my age. I'm like, well, I, I don't, like, go out. It's wrong with people. I'm not, I am not want to meet nobody over a computer in five minutes. Go out. Yeah. Meet but, them in person. Or meet was, them at work. But it was it was it was fun, Adrian. We had we had a, we had a good run. Uh, we worked for like X amount of I forget how many months. I don't even care to count for it. But we worked together uh, for about like six months. It was <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot from you. Uh, oh. I, I I definitely looked up to you as well as I did in Nakia, Tamara, and all those other people. So uh, thank you, thank you for being very good to me, being patient oh, with I me, it. and just being a phenomenal producer and helping me grow as a newcomer in this industry. Cause I wouldn't be here as disciplined as I am without people like you early on in my career, pushing me forward. So I appreciate that. Oh, that makes me feel good. Will. Uh, anything you want to plug, anything you want to share, anything you want to share out with the world, let them know where to find you. If I want to get in touch with you now is the time. The floor is yours. Um, well, they can check out my, uh, website kicksandlipsticks.com spell with x's um if you're interested it's editorial we have merchandise it's for anyone who's a sneaker head when i say sneaker i mean sneaker h-e-r so women who are sneaker enthusiasts who love sneakers want to know when the latest sneakers are coming out where you can get them um we also have apparel and sneaker bags this is my big thing um doing sneaker bags for women so uh, look out for that. They should be out um, next fall. And that's about it. Oh, and I have a show coming out called Sneaker Stories. That should be out um, this summer. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that has been my good friend and former co-worker and producer, Adrian Jacobs. You go in here and check her out, all of her stuff. And Adrian, we'll be sure to bring you back. Uh, my policy is once a quarter, so 90 days. You're allowed to come back anytime oh, after thanks. that. And we'll run it back and do it all over again. But ladies and gentlemen, my name is Will Tarashuk. It's T as in Thomas, A-R-A-S-H-U-K. I am the Tarashuk as the Talk More Tarashuk podcast. You can find anything we do, anything I do, anything I create all over the interwebs. Anywhere podcast can be found, this podcast is there, I promise you. But the most important place is ambiguouspodcastsolutions.com where you can check out all my other stuff, the Ambiguous Podcast Solution, all of Wrestle Act Radio, and my wrestling podcast, which is going seven years strong, approaching episode number 300. I can't believe that. 300 episodes. It's incredible. Uh, if you want to be a guest on this podcast, make sure you reach out to me. My email is will at APSpodcast.com. It's A-P-S-P-O-D-C-A-S-T.com. And if you make me go, ooh, that's interesting. Congratulations. <laughs> you are on the show. You get your spot. You book your ticket to Talking with Tara Shuck. I'll be back next time with someone who already booked their ticket, already paid that free 99. Talking about what? I don't know. We'll see. I do most of these podcasts on the fly. We'll see you there. <laughs>